Thank you, Dr. Coulter. Uh, really appreciate that introduction. I um, I second uh, Dr. Hernandez's uh, um, you know uh, congratulations on really organizing this. This is the second time I've uh, spoken at this um, conference, and um, it's not an easy thing to do, I'm sure. So again, thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I already cleared this, pre-cleared this with uh, Dr. Coulter. I'm going to kind of make some adjustments uh, to my talk. My talk was initially going to be two parts. One part was going to be kind of focusing on arrhythmias in, 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 in the female population and what's unique and what differences. There are gender-based uh, differences and a little bit, a touch a little bit also on arrhythmias in pregnancy. I'll give a shout out. Next Saturday, there's an arrhythmia symposium, the uh, Ali Masumi Arrhythmia Symposium uh, in the Houstonian. So if you want to get more detailed information, especially about arrhythmias in pregnancy, I advise that you guys uh, show up to that. But what I will uh, do is focus exactly on the topic that she asked us, uh, Dr. Coulter asked us to review, which is what is new in atrial fibrillation? And the answer obviously is typically a lot, but I'm gonna just focus on three studies and these are going to be, these are going to be, um, I think clinically relevant uh, studies that, um, have a has have had a large impact on our uh, clinical practice and i think um, um, their outcomes in some cases uh, are more nebulous and more subtle than what uh, we expected in the beginning although some in the ep community especially when it comes to the cabana trial which i'll get to in a second we're predicting that there's going to be some problems um, in terms of uh, uh, you know using that data to uh, guide our clinical decision making. So the first study is Crystal AF. Uh, Crystal AF basically is uh, it's a study that is uh, asking the question in patients with a cryptogenic stroke um, who often uh, you know receive cardiac monitoring. There's usually two ways to go about this. One is you can have them wear a monitor, an ambulatory monitor. You can wear two weeks, four weeks, uh, even six weeks amb ambulatory monitors. And the other group was an implantable loop recorder, which is, I'll show you here in a second, but um, you know, 30% of the ischemic strokes are of an unknown uh, mechanism, so-called uh, cryptogenic uh, strokes. And one of the most common cardiac causes is atrial fibrillation. The question is, often a patient will come in and their first symptom of atrial fibrillation is having a stroke. Uh, of course, at the time that they present, we don't know this, and this obviously, again, is going to have significant long-term sequelae in terms of oral anticoagulation and management uh, of these patients, so that there's no recurrence. So the question was, is it better? What's the best modality to be able to de detect the causative rhythm or the atrial fibrillation? In one group, you have what we would call implantable loop recorders, which are basically exactly what uh, those words say. They're tiny loop monitors. Two of the big companies make them. They go subcutaneous. And they have battery life that lasts typically up to three years. And they're just continuously monitoring. They store if there's an arrhythmia. Um, the second group, which is the standard group, is these ambulatory monitors. And the ambulatory monitors these days are, are pretty easy to, uh, to use. And, and the, the study's purpose was to then uh, compare the outcomes in terms of a, um, a diagnosis. So um, these patients were typically 40 years of age uh, or older, cryptogenic stroke. They had follow-up at one, three, six months uh, and, uh, using a 12-lead EKG or 24-hour uh, EKG monitoring or Holter. They also received TEEs and, of course, the CTA and MRA. So here's a loop recorder, plantable loop recorder. It literally takes 30 seconds to put one in. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, you make a little injection. You inject lidocaine subcutaneously, usually on the left uh, fourth intercostal space. And this, you literally, again, pop it in subcutaneously, and you get beautiful single-lead EKG. Uh, it is titanium, so MRIs are not an issue. There's no issues with, you know, um, magnetic interference or things of that nature. And most of my patients, after three years, they like to just keep it in because it's relatively, you know, inert. Uh, 
you can also now, nowadays have these ambulatory monitors, and actually the most common ambulatory monitor used in this study was not what we typically think about a five-lead Holter. It was a Zeo patch made by a company called iRhythm, and it consists of a monitor that you stick on, your, on the surface of the chest. It has a, a rubber covering so you can take a shower and things of that nature without difficulty. There's two weeks of recording, and in a newer iteration, actually, it will give you a trigger and no notify the physician if an arrhythmia occurs. You don't have to wait and you know, analyze it after, after two weeks of implant. Um, the, the patient wears it. They drop it off in the mailbox after, you know, after two weeks. We analyze the, the recordings, and, and then we um, see if they've had an arrhythmia. So the follow-up, again, as I said, one, six, and 12 months, and on every six months thereafter. And they recorded all the different types of uh, symptoms associated with potential uh, arrhythmias. And I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it, it's, it's a surprise to anyone, but I think it's important for us to see, you know, um, that implantable loop monitors detect these arrhythmias much more easily, much more frequently. And in fact, uh, the ambulatory monitors are somewhat useless for this purpose. So um, I think the, the current strategy is that when someone presents with a cryptogenic stroke, it's absolutely critical. This should become, these implantable loop recorders should become part of the clinical um, uh, streamlined uh, management. Um, and you can see here that, again, with controls, subjects, the percentage of AFib that was detected in these patients over time, it goes up to about 10% here. And here it's about 5%. I'm sorry, about 10%. So in conclusion, implantable loop recorders were superior to standard monitoring for detection of atrial fibrillation at six months, 12 months, 36 months, and moving forward. AF was detected in almost 10% and ultimately up to 30% of patients at, six, uh, at 36 months. So about a third of these patients do end up having atrial fibrillation as a cause, which should not be a big surprise, but to document it so effectively, I think, is impressive. And obviously, and this is a good piece of news, that once AF is detected, it does change the way that these patients are managed as it ought to in terms of oral anticoagulants versus antiplatelet agents. So this is the big study that I think everyone has talked about this past year, uh, the Cabana trial. Doug Packer, I'll tell you just how old and how long it took for this study to be, uh, to actually happen. I was Doug Packer's fellow still when he was starting this trial. So that was a while ago. Uh, and the, the, the study basically had very good intentions. It was, it was designed to look at the efficacy of atrial fibrillation ablation. Uh, in patients who, who had this, uh, who have this disease. And it was, I think, perhaps a little over ambitious. Um, at the time, uh, atrial fibrillation ablation was still kind of feeling its way, gaining its, uh, you know, a, a toehold in the clinical arena. And so the decision was made to take patients and compare and randomize into really three groups, medical therapy and, and, and not without rhythm control, rhythm control with pharmacologic therapy and ablative therapy. And perhaps again, over ambitiously, the primary endpoint was determined to be death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, or cardiac arrest. You know, for a disease like atrial fibrillation, who, that if you give oral anticoagulants and you, you know, treat the heart rate adequately, is, is really a symptom-driven problem. Um, looking at the efficacy of ablation in these patients and looking at its effect on death or disabling stroke, I think is something that, that's pretty ambitious and the data did uh, support this. Ultimately, after a, a medium uh, follow-up of about five years, there was a non-significant 14% reduction with ablation as assessed by intention to treat. And this was the big thing. If you got randomized to one of those groups, it turns out that the chances of you dying or having cardiac arrest or having a major stroke or bleed was really not that low or whether or not you had ablation. 
Um, and this is where all the controversy uh, started with this, uh, with this trial. Because if you, were, if you didn't look at the patients on an intention to treat basis, in other words, as the patients came in, over time a decision was made, okay, the medications are not working, or we, for whatever reason, decide that we want to switch into the ablation arm, then the numbers really dramatically shift in favor of ablation. And I think that we have to keep in mind that over the course of these five years of this study, or overall about 10 years of follow-up, are really the, the adolescent, teenage, prepubescent phase of, of atrial fibrillation ablation and the technique and the technology as it starts maturing. And as it starts maturing, correspondingly, more and more physicians and patients elect to go with the treatment of ablation as, they, you know, as, as its safety increases. And so what this study has been dogged by is the fact that there was such a high crossover between the group's in, intention to treat versus the therapy that they ultimately did receive. So here's a um, just kind of an uh, overview of, of those in terms of the incidence of atrial fibrillation. This is not, this is the intention to treat uh, groups. And of course, ablation, I, I don't think that there's any debate these days that ablation is more effective in rhythm control than medication, be it rate control or uh, anti-arrhythmics for uh, rhythm control. So, so that's, that's fine and dandy. And you can see also that the incidence of atrial fibrillation, flutter, and tachycardia over time Ablation has a higher percentage of patients who are free uh, from atrial fibrillation. This number is somewhat disappointing, but I think, again, we have to remember that a lot of this data comes from the periods where uh, atrial fibrillation still had its uh, acne and still had looked at its awkward stage and still was not really um, kind of uh, uh, at a more uh, presentable uh, phase of its, uh, of its process. And so the other point I think here is if you eliminate the atrial fibrillation patients, here drug and ablation with atrial flutter and tachycardia were similar. Yet again, something that we know in clinical practice, it's somewhat unusual. The atrial flutter ablation is over 90, 95% successful. And multiple studies since the beginning of the study uh, of Cabana have shown randomized trials that as a first-line therapy, ablation of typical atrial flutter is far vastly superior to, uh, uh, to pharmacologic management. And yet here you see that they really did not make a difference. So, um, and so here you can see over time as the incidence of patients who, with, who do have atrial fibrillation with drug versus ablation, and again, no surprises. The big debate with Cabana was the fact that that primary endpoint intention to treat did not, um, did not, was not positive. And I think Cabana is the ultimate Rorschach test. You know, if you're an EP who does ablations for a living, you can look at it in the frame of what I just described to you. If you are someone who believes the numbers, if and the numbers don't lie, and you have to go and be statistically rigorous, yes, it was a failure. So, you know, you, you, you kind of, as long as you understand why the study showed what it did and how that can be, and the nuances involved in interpreting it, then I, I think it, it's left open. Um, and then the AMAZE trial is a trial that uh, is just actually was completed. And I'm putting a plug for Dr. Rasek here, who was uh, the third leading, second leading um, uh, contributor to the study nationwide. And the MACE trial is a study that is looking at the use of the lariat, which was also invented by an alumni of THI, uh, Dr. Billy Cohn, which is a left atrial appendage occluder. And the question was not whether or not this left atrial appendage occluder is going to cause decreased stroke, but whether or not it actually helps in the management of persistent permanent atrial fibrillation. Uh, and, and the rationale behind that is that more tissue increases your susceptibility to arrhythmia. That's, it's as simple as that. Bigger hearts are more susceptible to arrhythmias because there's more tissue to have these reentrant uh, 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 rhythms and smaller tissues aren't. So what we call atrial debulking, 
electrical debulking uh, using this Lariat technology was studied. And, um, you know, I, th I think from what I've seen, it looks promising, but we won't know that for probably another 18 months or so. Um, it's technically, it's somewhat, I think, one of the more challenging uh, procedures. It requires dry pericardial tap. Things can happen, but, you know, use a micropuncture needle and, and things of that nature, and you decrease the incidence of, of some of those um, uh, complications. There was a very, very, very steep learning curve uh, with this uh, procedure. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're going to find out whether or not isolating, because unlike the watchman, which is a plug in the opening or the mouth of the left atrial appendage, the lariat actually mechanically cinches around the neck, and you basically strangulate not only the, the left atrial appendage, but the tissue itself, and over time it just infarcts and it sloughs off, and you lose that tissue in follow-up CT scans. It, it disappears. So, again... We will, uh, we will find out, but this, the study uh, was 600 participants, was just completed about three weeks ago, so we will know very soon. And thank you for this uh, opportunity and hopefully help get things on time.